Man, that Alex Jones fellow just can't catch a break. He can't use a fake bankruptcy to avoid billions of dollars of awards to these Sandy Hook victims. I have $130,000 under penalty of perjury. There's no hidden accounts. There's nothing in the Caymans. There's nothing, you know, on the moon. There's nothing. Yes, after years of spreading vicious lies and baseless conspiracy theories about the Sandy Hook massacre, Jones was found liable to the victims' families for $1.5 billion. But Jones thought he'd discovered that one weird trick to weasel out of paying the people he hurt, declaring bankruptcy. I declare. Nope, do not cut to that video, it's too easy. Yeah, except that a judge in Texas just shot down that effort, declaring that as a matter of law, at least $1 billion of Jones's judgment debts cannot be wiped away by bankruptcy. Why, oh why, do bad things very occasionally happen to bad people? So let's look at how Alex Jones tried to use bankruptcy law to avoid paying billions of dollars and why that effort failed so spectacularly. Now, if you want a more detailed account of Alex Jones and the Santa Hook trials, you can check out some of this channel's other videos on the subject, including the video I did where I explained how attorney Mark Bankston absolutely destroyed Jones on cross-examination. But to quickly summarize, for years, Alex Jones described the 2012 Sandy Hook massacre as a hoax and part of a secret government plot to take your guns. Jones's lies unleashed a wave of harassment on the victim's families, who are very much real, uh, triggering multiple civil lawsuits against him for defamation, intentional infliction of emotional distress, and other torts. In late 2022, a Connecticut jury jury awarded $965 million in compensatory damages and $473 million in punitive damages to the families of 26 people who were killed in the 2012 shooting, plus an FBI agent who was among the first responders. In August of 2022, a Texas jury found Jones liable for $4.2 million in compensatory damages and $45.2 million in punitive damages to Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis, whose uh, six-year-old son was killed at Sandy Hook. And before that, in October 2021, a Texas judge found Jones liable for defamation against Leonard Posner and ex-wife Veronique De La Rosa, whose six-year-old son was also killed. The pair are still waiting for a trial on damages. In all three cases, uh, the courts had entered default judgments against Jones based on repeated violations of discovery orders, resulting in Jones being adjudged liable on all causes of action without trial. Yeah, that's what we like to call here a huge FAFO alert. But Jones had made it clear that he had no intention of ever paying his victims, calling the damage wards hilarious and telling his audience he plans to file appeals to keep the victims in court for years. Jones also claims he's officially out of money, having repeatedly begged his audience to send him money to keep him on the air. And to that effect, Free Speech Systems, Jones's company that runs InfoWars, declared bankruptcy in July 2022, and Jones filed for personal bankruptcy in December. And since many people's understanding of bankruptcy is limited to knowing that's how you lose at Monopoly, Here's a quick explainer. Filing for bankruptcy provides a legal process for the reduction or elimination of certain debts. In bankruptcy court, parties' debts, including those incurred by court judgments, are categorized as either dischargeable or non-dischargeable, depending on how they were incurred. If the court deems a debt to be dischargeable, the debtor is no longer personally liable for the underlying debt and is excused from any obligation to pay. Common examples of dischargeable debts include credit card and medical debt. In contrast, non-dischargeable debts cannot be extinguished in bankruptcy, typically for public policy reasons. A section 523 of the Bankruptcy Code lists examples of non-dischargeable debts such as domestic support and tax obligations. Now, ultimately, Jones wants to have part or all of his $1.5 billion in judgments declared dischargeable, so he and his company no longer have to pay them. But to prevent Jones from erasing his judgment debts, the Sandy Hook plaintiffs formally intervened in the bankruptcy process. Now, of course, if you're ever hit with a $1.5 billion defamation judgment, you're gonna need a good lawyer. But if you want a great lawyer, my firm, the Eagle Team, can help. If you've been in a car crash, dealt with sexual harassment, or suffered from cancer, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney who can. It's so important to talk to a lawyer early to make sure you get the maximum recovery and choose the right options. So just click on the link in the description for a free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle Team. The link is down below. In March of 2023, the Sandy Hook plaintiffs from Connecticut and Texas filed four adversary complaints against Jones and Free Speech Systems in the bankruptcy court. In these complaints, Sandy Hook plaintiffs allege the judgment debts are non-dischargeable pursuant to the Bankruptcy Code Section 523A6, which excludes from discharge any debt that was the result of a, quote, willful and malicious injury against another. The families and other critics believe that Jones is abusing the bankruptcy process to welch on his debts. And back in March, Jones was accused of transferring up to $10 million to friends and family members to put it beyond the reach of creditors. And contrary to Jones's newfound claims of poverty, an August 2023 court filing from the victim's families paints quite the opposite picture, detailing Jones's hundreds of thousands of dollars in lavish spending. So the Sandy Hook plaintiffs moved for summary judgment against Alec Jones to prevent the $1.5 billion in judgment debts from being discharged, i.e. expunged, through bankruptcy. And a moving party is entitled to summary judgment upon showing that there is no 
genuine dispute as to any material fact that might affect the outcome of the suit, and thus the matter does not need to be decided by a full trial. Judges may also grant a partial summary judgment by ruling on some factual issues while leaving others for trial. And in separate state-specific motions, the Texas and Connecticut plaintiffs argue that the state court records established that requisite undisputed facts to conclude that Jones uh, inflicted willful and malicious injuries on the parties, and that the judgment debts arising out of such conduct are non-dischargeable as a matter of law. The plaintiffs further argued that Jones is barred from relitigating the finding that his conduct was willful and malicious under the principle of collateral estoppel because those facts were conclusively established before a different court. That's one of those rules that prevents someone that lost in court to go to a different jurisdiction and get a different trial and trying to undo that verdict. And not surprisingly, Jones opposed summary judgment, arguing that there has not been a formal determination of willful and malicious injury because the state court findings were default judgments, not full trials, and therefore collateral estoppel did not apply. And Jones further argued that the state court judgments against him were unfair and unconstitutional, and the bankruptcy court should not grant them full faith and credit by honoring their validity. And in two state-specific rulings against Jones, but not his company, U.S. Bankruptcy Judge Christopher Lopez of the Southern District of Texas granted partial summary judgment on most of the issues in favor of the Sandy Hook plaintiffs, while declaring that a few issues couldn't be summarily resolved and had to go to trial. Now, under long-standing Supreme Court precedent, collateral estoppel prevents issues of fact that were already determined by a valid and and final judgment in a previous lawsuit from being relitigated in any subsequent lawsuit that involves the same parties. In bankruptcy court, plaintiffs can invoke collateral estoppel to establish that a debt is non-dischargeable. To determine if collateral estoppel applies, courts analyze the law of the state in which the judgments were entered. Under Texas law, collateral estoppel bars parties from relitigating issues when one, the facts sought to be litigated in the second action were fully and fairly litigated in the first action, Two, those facts were essential to the judgment in the first action. And the standard for collateral estoppel in Connecticut is basically the same with slightly different verbiage, like saying necessary to the judgment instead of essential. Now, Jones argued that collateral estoppel is inapplicable because one, the precise issue of willful and malicious conduct was not fully and fairly litigated since the three default judgments were entered against him without trial. And two, Jones was blocked from making certain defenses for the damages trials and thus denied the opportunity to fully participate in the action. But the bankruptcy court rejected those arguments writing that, quote, default judgment orders like the ones entered against Jones have the effect of fully and fairly adjudicating a claim, and thus the issue of willful and malicious were properly litigated. Now, under bankruptcy law, debts arising from reckless or negligently inflicted injuries are subject to discharge, while debts arising from an intent to injure are generally non-dischargeable. Uh, for an injury to be the result of willful and malicious conduct, there has to be an intent to cause the injury, not just the act which leads to the injury. And to determine if there was an intent to cause injury, the court has to analyze from a reasonable person's perspective whether the defendant's actions were substantially certain to cause harm and are such that the court ought to infer that the debtor's subjective intent was to inflict a willful and malicious injury on the plaintiff. And to illustrate that distinction, Judge Lopez noted that a debtor's act of intentionally driving a car into a crowded bar and killing a creditor's relatives was found to be based on willful and malicious injury, while a debtor who illegally sold a rifle to an individual who years later shot people did not commit a willful and malicious injury. So in the latter case, the debtor's illegal intent to sell the rifle was not an act intended to cause harm to third parties, while purposefully driving a car into a bar clearly does involve a willful intent to injure. And turning to the Jones matter, Judge Lopez found that the petitions in the Texas and Connecticut cases contain multiple clear allegations about Jones's intent to cause those plaintiffs harm or substantial certainty that Jones's actions would cause harm. And under Texas and Connecticut law, all allegations in a petition are deemed admitted and the defendant's liability is established if a default judgment is entered against the defendant based on a discovery abuse. And you can see in the complaints in Texas and Connecticut that there are plenty of allegations that talk about Jones engaging in willful and intentional conduct. And that's a big problem for Jones because when you default in a case, it means that you are deemed to have admitted every single allegation in that complaint. So accordingly, Judge Lopez concluded the deemed admissions were sufficient to establish that Jones inflicted willful and malicious injury on the Sandy Hook plaintiffs, and the issue was fully and fairly litigated for the purposes of collateral estoppel. And then addressing the second prong of collateral estoppel, Judge Lopez concluded that the finding that Jones inflicted willful and malicious injury was necessary and essential to the Connecticut and Texas cases. Judge Lopez noted that the juries in the Connecticut and the Heslin Lewis damages trial made specific factual findings that Jones acted with an objective certainly of harm 
and a subjective motive to cause harm, made, quote, findings about a deliberate and intentional act meant to cause injury, not just a deliberate act that leads to injury, and the jury, quote, awarded damages based on these findings. And accordingly, Judge Lopez granted summary judgment finding the following debts are non-dischargeable as a matter of law, including the $965 million in compensatory damages plus the $150 million in punitive damages from the Connecticut case, and the $4.31 million in compensatory and exemplary damages in the Heslin Lewis defamation claim. However, Judge Lopez found that the record was not completely clear in some areas regarding what amounts of other damage awards were derived from reckless conduct, which is dischargeable in bankruptcy, as opposed to the intentional conduct, which is not. For example, the jury instructions for intentional infliction of emotional distress in the Heslin Lewis matter said Jones acted either intentionally or recklessly with extreme and outrageous conduct. Since the jury did not differentiate between what damages flow from reckless conduct, uh, a debt uh, of which is dischargeable, versus willful and malicious conduct, debt of which is non-dischargeable, this issue couldn't be resolved on summary judgment. So accordingly, Judge Lopez denied summary judgment for in order to trial to resolve uh, what damages stem from willful and malicious injury versus reckless conduct with respect to several of the intentional infliction of emotional distress claims uh, and the $321 million in attorney's fees awarded as uh, common law punitive damages in the Connecticut case. Now, Jones argued that the judgments against him are unconstitutional and unfair, and thus the bankruptcy court should refuse to honor the judgments against him. He also asserted that the default judgments should not be afforded the preclusive effect of collateral estoppel, claiming that he was denied the opportunity to actively participate in litigation due to the default judgments and was wrongly prohibited from raising certain defenses. Now, the court declined to consider Jones's argument that the judgments were unconstitutional, stating in a footnote that the state court actions were fully and fairly litigated with Jones's participation, and the Supreme Court requires federal courts to give full faith and credit to state court judgments and jury awards. Uh, the court also rejected Jones's claim that the Connecticut court judgment was, quote, skewed with the intent to obtain a non-dischargeable judgment in anticipation of bankruptcy, noting, quote, there is no evidence of manipulation that even remotely warrants serious consideration of this argument based on the record before the court. Uh, Judge Lopez nonetheless informed Jones that he could make this argument, along with claims that he was denied the right to make certain defenses in the appropriate state appellate courts. And addressing Jones's claim that he was denied the opportunity to mount a defense, Judge Lopez highlighted that Jones had in fact participated in all three cases for multiple years, including the presenting of evidence for the Connecticut and the Heslin Lewis damages trial, but chose not to comply with discovery orders, knowing full well that he risked default judgment. So Jones has no one to blame but himself for his own predicament. And explaining why the court will give full faith and credit to the Connecticut and Texas default judgments, Judge Lopez quoted the Illinois case of Herbstein versus Bretman, quote, where a litigant participated extensively, then failed to comply with an express court order issued multiple times at a risk of incurring default, the litigant should not now be able to sidestep the collateral estoppel doctrine and litigate an issue in this forum that was forestalled in another court due solely to the litigant's decisions. The litigant is not entitled to a second bite at the apple. The issue underlying the default judgment were actually litigated for the purposes of the collateral estoppel doctrine. So to be clear, this saga is far from over. I don't know that we'll ever be over. Jones still has the right to appeal this ruling and the judgments in the other cases, but this is a monumental victory for the plaintiffs. And it's likely that without this ruling that Jones could have been free to liquidate the debt saddled free speech systems while being allowed to start another similar company free from the judgment debts. This in turn would have put the Sandy Hook families on the path of collecting only a fraction of the awarded damages. Now, the Sandy Hook families can continue to seek the maximum amount of recovery, and of course, Alex Jones could have avoided all this drama if he just paid what he owes. Hey, next time pay your bills. But I don't want to. But that's pretty weak tea, which is the opposite of the excellent coffee that I get from today's sponsor, Trade Coffee. Trade's great because not only do they have a huge selection of your favorite coffees, but they have a fine-tuned matching process that helps you discover fresh coffee based on your taste preferences. I have a very specific taste in coffee. I basically want something that tastes like hot chocolate and pairs well with milk. And Trade was able to find me the perfect bean. And let's be honest, you claim you want a rich dark roast, but you really want a coffee milkshake like I do. But either way, Trade has you covered. And now that fall is here, it's the perfect time to drink piping hot coffee, or if you're a crazy person like my friends, it's the perfect time to drink ice cold cold brew, which Trade also has a huge selection of. And with Trade, you can discover new coffees from the nation's top roasters. You can choose your coffee, rate it, and your coffee suggestions get even better every time. All conveniently delivered straight to you is really the best coffee website out there. 
And if you already know what you like, they probably already have your favorite roaster in stock at a great price. You can even choose whole beans or your preferred grind. So if you'd like to try Trade Coffee, Legal Eagles will get their first bag free when they sign up. All you have to do is click on the link that's in the description or the one that's on screen right now. And not only will you get your first bag free, you'll also get free shipping. So get your first bag free by clicking on the link that's on screen right now. And after that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.